In December of 2023, I was invited to attend a gathering in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, Colombia, known as the heart of the world by the four indigenous people of this area. A small group of people were welcomed by the Arhuaco tribe to come learn from them, to hear their message, to receive a deeper understanding of the importance of this place and to help protect it from the deforestation and ecosystem loss that is rapidly affecting this sacred land. This is the first time in history that an event of this kind has taken place, where many of the Arhuaco gathered to receive and guide people from outside the heart of the world. This film shares my journey to this sacred land and gives a look at what we experienced, how the Arhuaco live, what is happening to their territory, and how it is reflecting a much bigger problem that we are facing as a species. All right, so this is everything that I'm bringing to Colombia. I'm going to be staying off grid for a few weeks, so everything that I have needs to fit in this bag. So I'm bringing my tent, sleeping bag, sleeping pad, towel, I've got some camera equipment, uh, drone, I've got personal hygiene stuff, bag of clothes, some extra power banks so I can charge things out there. Uh, I'm bringing a water bottle, first aid kit, extra lens, pillow, flute, and a hat. And all of that is going in here, and that's all that I'm going to have for the next few weeks. On November 30th, I began my journey with a ride to the Phoenix airport. I then boarded a four-hour flight to Miami, where I transferred to another five-hour flight to Bogota. After arriving at 1 a.m., I was guided through the very slow customs line, where I was granted entry into Colombia. I then got a taxi outside the airport and went to the nearest hotel to get a few hours of rest. So after 10 hours of travel and two different flights, I have finally arrived in Bogota. And the local time is 2 a.m. I've got another flight tomorrow morning to Valladupar at 8.30. So hoping that I get a few hours of good sleep before I continue on my journey. After sleeping a few hours, I went downstairs to the lobby and had some coffee to fuel me for the journey ahead. I made it to the airport at 7.30 to have time to check in for my 8.30 flight to Valladupar. After arriving, I was told that my flight had been rescheduled for the next day at 6 p.m. due to weather. I waited in line to speak to the person at the airline counter and they said they could get me on a flight at 8 p.m. So I spent the next 12 hours waiting around the Bogota airport, reading, napping, meditating, scrolling aimlessly on my phone, and eventually boarding the one-hour flight north to Valladupar. I arrived around 9.30 p.m. and got a taxi to a local hotel where I was greeted by Kelsey Faith, one of the organizers of this gathering. We then met those in the group that had already arrived at a small food vendor down the street. I got to meet some of the amazing humans I would be spending the next two weeks with, and I had an incredible conversation with Diam, the other key organizer of the gathering, talking about the Arwako people and getting a better understanding of what exactly we would be doing here. Diam is an awesome human and the co-founder of Sun Nation, an organization that focuses on collaborative developments with indigenous communities co-creating regenerative systems that align with ancient wisdom to tackle the modern-day global issues that we collectively face. He has been working closely with the Arwako for the last few years, and he and Kelsey Faith organized this gathering and opportunity for myself and the others in our group to learn from the Arwako people. So the Arwakos are one of the four indigenous peoples of Colombia. They live in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, which is a coastal mountain range on the Caribbean Sea. 
and they are the guides for the other three tribes in that collective of four. There's the Arawakos, Kogi, Kankwamo, and Wiwa. And the Arawakos being the most powerful at the time, let's not like put it in the sense of strength and ego and stuff, but they're, they're the ones elected to be the guides. And as the cycles continue, the tribes trade whoever is guiding dependent on their embodiment of consciousness. Uh, the Arwakos, they live within the, the Black Line, which is their constitutional reservation. Um, with the Colombian government. It's not recognized as it should be, but they do have reservations within that black line, along with the other three tribes. And they, their government and wise men live up in a village called Nabusimake, and then above Nabusimake in the surrounding hillsides. So um, they say that the black line is an energetic, um, literal immaterial but energetic line that exists and inside of it is the heart of the universe also known as the heart of the world and that it symbolizes when earth was first created and when the universe first came into materialization that inside the black line is where the first mountains and the first um, physical aspects of the earth were put and then from there, they were copied and pasted around the rest of the earth. So the original creation that is connected to all other aspects of the planet is contained within the black line that is called the heart of the world. So it's really interesting. They look at, um, in, in their cosmology, they say that the black line itself, everything inside of it, for instance, the first mountains that were created, the big mountains, that are inside the black line, they're connected to small mountains outside of the black line. And the little mountains are connected to big mountains. So there's an inverse between what is within and what is without the black line. In that sense, there's like um, an entanglement of energy and the same goes for different species or um, different peoples. And for instance, there is a small ant that has stripes on it and they say that this little ant represents the tigers in Africa. So when they see those ants doing something specific and something different than what is normal, they can know that there's something happening for the tigers in Africa on a, in an ecosystem level. And there's representatives of each species inside the black line. It's almost like they have ambassadors or emissaries. And the mamos go around and, and they observe all of this from a physical level and an energetic level and um, walk around the mountains, the original mountains of our planet, inside the black line. And in doing that, they have a direct connection to the, the entangled mountains across the planet to understand and read the energies and, and learn about um, everything that's happening. It's almost like a supercomputer for the planet and everything there is represented. A mamo is uh, in our culture, maybe it could be like a high priest or priestess would be a zaga. Um, a lot of people like to call them shamans, but it's something much more higher than that. Um, and I think the best way to encapsulate that into words would be to say um, that they are the bridge be for the veil, like between the veil of the material world and the immaterial world. And in between these mamos, they're um, men or women are zagas um, and then they represent the um, the interpreters between nature and um, and humans and they're the ones who are in charge of um, organizing and making sure that tranquility harmony everything keeps going as it goes and and they can see the energies um, of the different patterns and between the beings and the immaterial world and material world and they have all of these abilities that allow them to be great interpreters and what we might call masters. The four indigenous peoples in general um, refer to themselves as elder brother and everyone outside of the black line at this moment is considered a little brother and there's a lot of nuances with that um, but in the essence and base of it 
it comes to be that the elder brothers, uh, they received certain knowledges and mandates when they were first placed on this planet millions of years ago. And they say that they were given the responsibility to take care of Earth. And there's a lot of depth that we could go into, but there's other worlds and other suns and other universes that they speak upon. And this one that we embody right now is just like preschool or kindergarten. And it's just like, oh, welcome to the physical world. It's really neat. Um, and in this neat world, it's a paradise and everything's made for you. And we're just supposed to be here to learn about how systems function and not to create anything yet. The other worlds that we graduate to is where we start creating. But something happened and um, a lot of our people started to try to create things and disconnect from the real objective of being in this first world. And in that sense, those people who have been disconnected and who are trying to create of their own accord with their own images and inventions, those are considered to be the little brothers. And little brothers have graduated to taking care of fire and they like fire a lot. Um, and they say that that is because we used to be really, really powerful in other worlds. And now that we have forgotten that, it's in our DNA that we are relating to this need to invent and to create. And since it's so innate with us and we're so good at it, that it comes out into this world of fire that we're um, co-creating. So as Little Brother, we are currently you know, creating violence and war and, and fighting with each other and, and creating engines and bombs and you know, planes and all kinds of things that operate on fire. Where the Elder Brother has a huge, vast understanding of all of the elements and how to create with any of them how you would wish. And also how to respect what is also already created here on the planet and to know that this is a place just to learn. Um, so in that essence, there is a big difference between what Little Brother is doing and what, little, what Elder Brother is doing. And they feel that as Little Brother is born into this world, that it's their job to always be there ready to help Little Brother whenever they're falling down, whenever they're doing things that are damaging to themselves, as an Elder Brother would, and be responsible for them. And for a very long time, they've been extending their hands out to say, okay, well, we're waiting for you to finally graduate, to want to learn about this world that we're in, and to, to stop damaging and to raise your consciousness, and we're here to help you do that the whole time. And we are your elder brother, we are your guides, and we've never lost that connection, and we never will. And that's what their mandates are. So in that relationship, they've been constantly waiting for us, and now seems to be the moment when more of us are ready for that calling, and they're very excited. Last year, um, the, the Arwako government under uh, Umake and Nikuma asked uh, our organization, Sun Nation, to go out into the world and try to find the most conscious and uh, earthen and like nature-connected people within our circles that, that want to expand and, and grow into that connection. So we spent the last year going around and um, as resonance happened through the speed of trust and um, invitation, we met different people and, and that has coalesced into a great group of people now who all have the same mission of wanting to embody more consciousness and connect to Mother Earth and get on a path of uh, a path that is guided by our elder brothers in order to learn more how we can be impactful in this transition from where we're at now to where we want to go as a collective. So now that we have come together through those invitations, uh, we finally we're in the first moment, we're still people landing from the planes, um, we're all going to be together tonight and um, we're being received by uh, some of the leaders of the Arwakos and then some of their mamos and we'll be going to the river in order to have our first uh, reunion cleansing ceremony and then they're going to take us up to a very special place called Gunke Roan and there we'll be met by 40 of their representatives uh, we have 16 people coming from our little brother experience and it will be the first time in history where their um, 
officials and their tribal members on such a grand scale are coming together with the same path uh, and understanding. And we're going to spend 12 days together up there uh, receiving teachings and what they call required works. And then they're going to guide us down the way of figuring out how to um, in figuring out how to be a part of what their plan is for helping humanity, which is basically raising our each of our consciousnesses uh, individually and then binding us together as a collective. Uh, and in doing that, um, one of the biggest goals is to take care of the heart of the planet. So we're going up there to receive from them different aspects that we need in order to grow and in order to connect to the heart of the planet to reconnect ourselves to our mountains and our aspects of nature and then to be presented to them and then to be presented from them a plan to move forward that we can then communicate back to our community as community leaders and start this momentum moving forward. So the next morning at 5 a.m. the group gathered and headed to the river formed by many of the mountain streams where we bathed in the water, performed a ceremony, and were officially welcomed into the energy of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta Mountains. We're about to be landing at the river from many sacred mountains that are giving us the blessings. We're asking for permission to be able to go up to the heart of the world and uh, Soon we'll be right now, right now in this moment, we're gonna be stopping uh, por, por allá, allá arriba, uh, and crossing over and going down there. The mamos, aquí nomás, uh, the mamos have been going for thousands and thousands of years to, to pay payments, energetic payments down to this river. And uh, yeah, we're about to be able to experience that as a collective with little brothers, sisters. Go. Ooh, let's go. <laughs> our Arwako guides led us down a trail to a sacred river. The urban sprawl of the city has polluted some of this area with garbage, and many motor vehicles and food vendors occupy the nearby street. Still, after a short walk, we found a private area along the river where we sat and were guided in a ceremony. We were given small balls of cotton to hold in our hands and instructed to visualize all of the negativity that we have carried with us from the artificial world and to channel it into these cotton balls. Much of the spiritual works of the Arwako involve visualization practices. After some time meditating and focusing our negativity into the cotton, we were then instructed to offer these cotton balls to the river and to visualize that they would be directed to the bottom of the ocean in the Caribbean Sea, where a volcanic triangle would receive the cotton balls to burn them and purify them with the energies of earth and fire. After this, we received cotton bracelets to protect us and welcome us into the heart of the world. I imagine this was like the ancient equivalent of getting a wristband when entering a venue. Once we had wristbands, we were invited to swim in the river to officially be embraced by the energy of the mountains. Following this, we returned to our taxis and traveled for an hour into the black line, entering the energetic portal that is the heart of the world. We first stopped at a hostel in Pueblo Bayo, a town that exists within the black line illegally. Since 1973, the Colombian government has recognized the Black Line as the ancestral territory of the four indigenous people. The Territorial Indigenous Council of Governors of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta describes the Black Line as a grand system of interconnected land, sea, and air nodes considered sacred as a whole. It is the space from which the culture of the four indigenous peoples of the Sierra Nevada arises and where it is recreated. But because of the many valuable resources in this area, such as oil and gold, there are competing visions for the future of the Black Line. On August 6, 2018, Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos 
signed a decree that recognizes the ancestral territory of the indigenous communities of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta as defined by the sacred sites of the Black Line. Still, construction, mining, deforestation, farming, and other activities occur illegally in this area, and an entire town has been constructed within this sacred territory, completely neglecting the rightful territory of the four indigenous people. We regrouped in this town, gathering last minute supplies like fruit, water, toilet paper, and blankets, before heading up several thousand feet to Genkeroen, the land where our group would be hosted. Upon arriving, we were greeted by numerous Arwako men and women and were told that we could establish our camp here. We also performed another ceremony, welcoming us to this space and to this collective experience. The trees, the birds, the birds. people are going to come. They're going to bathe early and they're going to come here. The birds are going to come. The pájaros te enseñan a armonizar todo. ¿Por qué? They're going to show us how to harmonize everything. Los pájaros primero cantan antes de comer una fruta. Because first the birds sing before they eat any fruit. Los humanos tenemos que ser también como los pájaros. The humans Gracias. also need to say, Gracias, be like the birds. Gracias, Sol. Thank you. Gracias, Luna. Thank you. Para Thank comer. you to everybody. Thank you to the sun, to the moon. Thank you for so that we can eat. Los pájaros cantan. Los animales del monte cantan the animals antes sing. de comer. Gracias. The birds sing. They're all singing. Thank, thank you. Before eating. Primero hay que darle gracias a la naturaleza, al sol. We need to give thanks to nature. De comer un desayuno. Before breaking fast, having a breakfast. Sí o no? Sí o no? Sí. Our group settled in for the night, sitting around the fire, connecting, getting to know each other more, and the next day, I was invited to leave the group with Diam to join him on a special mission to Nabusimake, a mountain village and the spiritual home of the Arwako people. Not many people are welcomed to this village, so I felt honored for the opportunity to go. I was invited to film and document a deal between an energy company and the Arwako people. For years, there has been great pressure to mine the mountains around Nabusimake. The Arwako hold all mountains as sacred beings and hold the mountains around Nabusimake as particularly sacred. An energy company offered to make a deal with the Arwako, allowing them to put solar panels on the mountain to sell the energy back to the city. While the Arwako don't want any development on these mountains, they recognize that this will allow them to protect the mountains from being mined. The energy company also offered to help build new villages for the Arwako people as part of the deal. On the night of our arrival, Diam and I gathered with Boom Kwanimaku, the external chief of the Arwako people. We sat in a traditional clay house for hours where I was able to ask him many questions about the Arwako people and their philosophy. And he shared with me, in great depth, the forces of colonization that they have been fighting for generations. As the hours passed, the temperature dropped significantly. We had a small fire inside the hut, but limited wood, so it didn't last long. We then slept in the hut on the clay floor, and with the cold temperatures, no blankets, and empty stomachs, it was not a restful night. At around 6 a.m., we woke up to greet the sun, drank from the nearby stream, then headed to the gathering site where the meeting was held around 8 a.m. I witnessed and documented the exchange and got some amazing photos of some of the mamos. I felt truly honored to be in the presence of these powerful beings. After an hour or so of dialogue in Spanish and Iku, their native language, an agreement was eventually made. Shortly after, Diam and I returned to Gunkeroen. We received a warm welcome from the group, and moments later, we gathered in the jungle to receive some teachings from Boom Kwanimaku. You see it in the natural world, because that is where the, light, the universal light 
is a lot of people leave this universal light and they start to do artificial things and they get enslaved in that space and that's where they get chained because you leave the natural immense world Porque mucho, mucha the persona immensities of nature in vertical okay. mucha gente ah, because mucha persona uh, <laughs> because a lot of people are thinking in vertical entonces empiezan como a trabajar pensar en universal en un circo uh -huh. pero hay una línea vertical uh, they start that's a que no horizontal tiene fin. so a lot of people are thinking in horizontals and then they expand and they try to go out but it's always a circle everything mm -hmm. leads back to itself in the horizontal world but there's a different one, it's a circle that doesn't have a way to leave, but the other way is what their original laws are around is the vertical life, where there's, there's no end, there's infinite possibilities, spiraling. The people who live in their thoughts, Entonces, in, the, circo vicioso, in the circle, solamente. it's a vicious circle, mm -hmm. it's a labyrinth. <laughs> <laughs> you go inside and you just keep coming back to the same point. Mm -hmm. in, in the natural world it's vertical and it's infinite. Mm -hmm. But when someone says vertical and when someone says they start to walk in the vertical line, como si se siente como uno le dijeran, you feel as if someone said you, you start to feel like you're going in circles but it's leading you up <laughs> spiraling Entonces, si uno empieza a vivir con el mundo natural, so if someone uno empieza starts to live with the natural world one starts como to a mirar, escuchar to y entender la línea vertical listen and understand the vertical line Entonces ya uno empieza también a liberar en la mente. So then also you start to get liberated in the mind. Entonces es importante ser líder a la línea vertical. So it's important to be a leader of the vertical line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bun Kwanimaku shared with us a few core themes that carried throughout his messages. For one, he shared that little brother, meaning all of us outside the black line, lives primarily in the artificial world. We originate from the natural world, but because we are caught in the artificial world, we don't recognize who we really are or where we come from. As a result, we are harming the natural world and consequently harming ourselves. We are nature, and so by harming nature, we only harm ourselves. He also shared how people in this world are caught in the vicious circle of their thoughts, what he called the horizontal line, and that one who is living in harmony with the natural world follows the vertical line, which represents a continual evolution of consciousness as one learns life lessons. He mentioned that it can seem like one is in a circle, but it is really a spiral. To me, the meaning of this is well reflected in a quote by Barry Jalepsi that says, The path isn't a straight line, it's a spiral. You continually come back to things you thought you understood and see deeper truths. The next day, we moved our camp further up the mountain into a dense jungle that was alive with insects, birds, and other small creatures. Well, it's been a few days in the jungle and I am full of bug bites on my legs. Um, I've completely become a barefoot hippie. <laughs> I haven't worn shoes in a few days. We spent a few nights on top of this mountainside, coming together as a community, doing a few ceremonies with the Arwako, and spending a lot of time together, which was overall really loving, a really beautiful group of people. 
sometimes challenging when living close with people for so long, things can come up, but we've moved through everything overall pretty gracefully. Um, today is day four or five, and we have moved up to a mountain where we are going to be participating in a ceremony with many mamos that's supposed to be really profound, something that hasn't happened um, in history really because a bunch of different mamos are coming here and different members and leaders of the Arwako people are coming together with Little Brother, the um, Western civilization or essentially the rest of the world to learn from each other and essentially for them to teach us and to help us let go of fear, let go of doubt, and to really connect with what it is that we want so that we can have clarity on what we want and how to manifest that in the universe. And there's a huge emphasis on that being returning to and protecting nature because we are nature. And that's really the the key theme here and like the Im imperative thing that has been spoken about and that's awakening in all of us is this remembrance of our connection to nature and our desire to defend nature because we are nature we rely on nature and without nature there's no life so they really embody that here and that's what i've witnessed over these past few days with many profound experiences and lessons that have been coming through um the mamos in general but specifically bun kwanimaku who is a, a leader of the arwako um he's He's really wise and profound, and he's brought through a lot of incredible messages for our entire group. So I'm here, and I'm excited to see what unfolds in these next few days on this mountain. The jungle here was a big shift in environment from the land we were camping on before. During the day, it was relatively calm, with some crickets and bird songs, but at night it came alive, and many insects, bats, and birds played their part in the jungle symphony. The ground was crawling with spiders, scorpions, and other insects, and upon realizing this, some of the people in the group were unsettled. Bunkwanimaku said, there are many poisonous and deadly things in this jungle, but the worst thing we could do is what we were doing at this moment, living in fear. He said that these beings are our friends. They are defenders of nature. And as long as we are in harmony, peace, love, and joy, they will not hurt us. His words were reassuring, and the many Arwako men sleeping on the jungle floor with no concern whatsoever was even more reassuring. We waited for hours for Kungama, our guiding Mamo, to arrive. As we waited, Bumkwanimaku gave us some more teachings to reflect on. Just like as, we, as it said, one is everybody, one is everything, and everything is one. So in that sense, all of these people who are outside who are invading our minds when we have thoughts of all of these experiences we need to become the light and know that we are the light and we're supported by all of these yeah. microorganisms yeah. and these beings and yeah. this space in nature and this mountain that is the leader of peace and be able to use that and be a representative of all of these beings from this space and bring that out to our groups our meetings and our spaces and places and show them what the light is Kungama arrived just before midnight and led us through a spiritual work involving visualization on the positive things that we would like to cultivate in our lives, channeling that positive energy into cotton balls that they then gathered from us to offer to the earth as an energetic payment. The next day in the jungle, we mostly rested and spent time around the fire. At one point, Bun Kwanimaku began to give some teachings while relaxing in his hammock. Entonces dicen como ser humano todos vivimos 
encima de la tierra. So all humans mm -hmm. live here on top of the earth. Y la tierra para nosotros uh, simplemente tierra no sabemos qué qué dimensión la palabra quiere de, de decir tierra. And when we say porque nosotros decimos kagum, tierra, que uno es we don't hijo. No, exactly what dimension we're talking about. De, so we say kagum, de la tierra. Which means ka es tierra. Gum to being es que somos hijos. A son of the earth, a child of the earth. Entonces, como todo hijo de la madre tierra, earth, ustedes vinieron para ser ejemplo earth, to donde están viviendo ustedes. Where we are living, to represent y de acá examples. también seremos ejemplo para ustedes. And here they are to be for us. Porque hay veces todos pensamos que la naturaleza existe por existir. The nature exists Pero no exist, entendemos la realidad de la vida de la naturaleza. But we don't understand the reality of the life of nature. Entonces muchas veces nos descuidamos nosotros mismos. So a lot of the times we start to neglect and not care for it Entonces, our, creo ourselves. Entonces este momento es buen mensaje this para nosotros y también para ustedes para apoyarnos. Message for us and also for you guys so that we can support each other. Y también siento agradecido por lo que están acá. And I also feel grateful por lo que están invirtiendo su tiempo y su voluntad y gana. For investing your time and your space here. Entonces a veces las montañas siempre hay una montaña más alta que es patrón del lugar y del mundo. And there's, in the mountains there's always one space highest that is the like one in charge of all things and the world. Entonces, all ustedes llegaron a un lugar donde está el padre y madre de todas las montañas donde viven ustedes. And now we've gathered in a place where all of the fathers and all of the mothers are together in charge of all of the mountains on the planet where we live. Uh, entonces ustedes vinieron en representación de las montañas y de las madres que sostienen las montañas del de lugar donde están viviendo. So we came as representatives a visitar esta montaña el corazón del mundo. Of our mountains and our mothers and fathers and to come and connect to it and become part of the heart of this planet. Como interrelacionarse con todos los componentes de la tierra que están uh, cuidando. As if we are interrelating to all of the different components of the earth that we are taking care of. Entonces por igual nosotros invitamos a ustedes que esto se vaya multiplicando para ir entendiéndonos. So in the same sense, we invite you guys to continue out and multiply so that you guys can continue understanding us. Entonces, por igual, yo creo que de pronto en el lugar uno hace muchas cosas buenas, pero la gente no lo va a entender. Y cuando uno va a hacer algo bueno en otro lugar y cuando empieza a escuchar, dicen a que esa persona hizo un buen labor en ese lugar, entonces empiezan como a, valorizar, a, a valorar también. Entonces, por lo menos aquí, digamos, con el gobierno de acá, nosotros nos devalorizan, o sea, que como no conocen, pero si nosotros vamos a guiar en su país y dicen que, bueno, nos están guiando el pueblo araco de Colombia en su país, entonces ya dirán, ah, que yo tengo un líder Entonces ya van a decir el mismo gobierno es porque yo le estoy apoyando. Mm. También sentirá alegre, ¿no? Mm -hmm. Entonces podría sentir lo mismo la gente de su país. Mm -hmm. Dicen que de su país vinieron a hacer un milagro, a, hacer, a sanar las montañas, la Sierra Nevada al norte, del César, o sea, al norte de Colombia. Entonces cuando ya empiezan a ver eso, dirán, es que yo también hago parte porque mi gente fueron de mi país a hacer eso. Mm -hmm. 
So, o sea, lo valora en otro lugar donde uno vaya a hacer. Sí. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of us do good things in the places that we're from, and many people don't see the good things that we do. But mm. when we decide to go somewhere else and do good things, then that gives a chance for others to start to value it and realize that you as a person are doing good things. Because it can become more visible from an external perspective when it's not so close. In the same way, if the Arwakos go to start working in other countries outside of here, and they start to guide other governments and give advice and show their values to others and it's respected and Colombia would say, oh wow, look, we have these leaders here. Oh yeah, oh, we're so happy that they're out there helping them. Oh yeah, it's because we're supporting them, you know, and they start to create a relationship that showcases this value and it can create much more interest and amplification of this positive understanding and, and change courses. So in that sense, what we're doing here can be start, now that we've done this here, it can start to be perceived by others and start to showcase more value within our networks and possibilities. And we can say, oh yes, look, we went to Northern Colombia in the heart of the world and we helped to heal these mountains. And we can say that. And other people related to us will be like, oh yeah, my friend, my person, my family member, that, that person did this thing, I know that. And, and it can start to create this experience of, of value and visibility. Entonces yo creo que esta es una forma de ir integrándonos y consolidándonos. Y todos están en su lugar. No, usted no sienta que son ajenos porque la montaña Biscungui son parte de, de todo y a la vez y allá están muchos que, que están, o sea, más arriba, o sea, casi de páramo. Hay sí, como ranas, hay otros animales pequeños que son del nevado y es lo mismo los árboles. Entonces quiere decir que todos podemos estar o llegar allí, convivir con ellos y, y, y directo, directamente todos todo ustedes están ahí. Y por igual nosotros busquemos cómo buscarle remedio para sanar con mucha gente. Mm. Uh -huh. Porque las ranas, no sé cómo, pero si llegan ahí, también preocupados. ¿Cómo lo podemos hacer? O sea, cantando los diarios. Mm. Uh -huh. So, this is a form for us to, together with them, all of us, to be continuing to integrate and consolidate between us. And in that, For us to not feel that we are foreign from the, in this space, but that we are home and that this is our heart and that we are here together, and grounding into that understanding because we're next to Biskungui, which is the father and mother of the foods and elements and nutritions for all of our people. And going to that mountain, there's many different beings there that we can associate with and connect to. And there are frogs and insects and birds and different species. And each day they're singing and they're asking, what can we do? How can we fix this? What's the solution? And they need help. 
And for us coming, realizing that this is our place and those are our mountains, we'll be connecting ourselves again so that we can be examples for others in the works we're doing. But we'll also be looking and creating, looking for and creating a remedy for many different people and many different beings with these Kungu, feeling that this is our home and our space as we integrate and consolidate further together. Entonces, de mi parte, para complementar, yo le diría, como es corazón del mundo, sienta que es su corazón. So, for my part, to complement what was said, I would like you to feel that this is the heart of the world and feel like it is your heart. <coughs> Todas las montañas de acá, seamos amigos de ellos, y de ellos sean que amigos de nosotros y a sus montañas que están en su lugar y en su país. All of the mountains here are our friends. And they are the friends of all of the mountains that are in our countries. Y a través de ellos nosotros somos hermanos. And between all of them, through all of them, we are brothers and sisters. Entonces no es de la misma necesidad, pero igual es una necesidad para la vida humana. And even though we don't have exactly the same needs, we have the same needs as humans for humanity. Entonces esta es una semilla que empezará a nacer y crecer. So this is a seed that is starting to birth and grow. Porque en este mundo no venimos a destruir, sino a dar y darle fuerza. Because in this life, we didn't come here to destroy. We came to give strength. Entonces nunca se, no vamos a sentir que somos incapaces, que somos poquitos, sino que somos universo. So we're never going to feel like we're incapable or that we're too few because we are universes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait. Good. 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 The next day, the majority of the group awoke early for a journey to Biskungui, a nearby mountain that holds great significance in their cosmology. The Arwako say that Biskungui energetically governs the entire food system of the planet, and we hiked to the top of the mountain so they could show us the deforestation that is occurring and how this is threatening not only this mountain, but the entire food system of the planet on an energetic level. There's a new coffee farm they just planted. This is how the farmers clear their land to ready to farm and burn it all. So they just cleared this, uh, the farmers just cleared this last year. And you can see, especially in that ravine over there, there's four of them. But that one's one of the bigger ones. Each one of these ravines has a spring in it. Mm. And now these farms are coming up to the canyon each one of the ravines and the farmers burn their land but then they also fumigate so there's glyphosate or whatever that thing is called in it and then every time it rains it brings that those chemicals down into the springs and then into the runoff and then down into the river and in the same time they're expanding and they clear this forest and in this specific spot where it's now clear which just got cleared last year there's specific animals that come here just to listen and go back and report to Nawasimake. It's like part of their ecosystem cycle of how they interact with the, the biosphere here. And now that there's no trees here, those animals can't come here anymore. So the water's getting poisoned, the land's getting, gonna have erosion, it's getting, losing all of its life, and the animals can't come here anymore either.
all because of farmers. We continued the hike up Biskungui, and as we did, we continued to see areas where big portions of the mountain have been burned, cleared, and planted with coffee, and not only planted with coffee, but fed with pesticides and many toxic chemicals that damage the land and the surrounding ecosystem. All right, so they're showing us here in these mountains right here where this, where this coffee is. This whole place has been deforested and burnt to plant coffee. They have a small uh, nursery down there and they want to show us so that we can capture this right here. It says uh, it's the category is two level t toxicity, moderately dangerous. It can hurt you. It is a concentrated soluble and it's an agricultural herbicide. And it's got paraquat ion, whatever that is. And so they're saying, see, here's the evidence. This is the poison that they use. And it goes down into the four different springs and carries it down into the river and killing things all along the way. Microorganisms, poisoning people, getting children sick. With poison, in our reserve, we, we do healthy practices. For a person, we have health and medicine, but this type of cultivation, you can see it. They do it with chemicals and fire. Uh -uh. Mm. They put another chemical that they put on the roots. Las venas. Y eso, and, y eso that, se lo echan a la, a la comida para que la comida produzca bastante. Entonces esa comida se va. chemical that's bad for your veins. Se va. And they put that on the food químico. so that it grows fast. Y ustedes But lo your food allá, itself has uh, that in it and then we eat it. Lo compran allá. In our space from our y, supermarket. Y eso son donde está and that's el where we start getting cancer and different eh, things because mental. it affects our, our blood veins and it affects our minds. <coughs> eso, entonces... So like we said just now, we don't know consumir. where this stuff comes from. Entonces, the food that we eat. Look, you can see they're thinking Entonces, about no taking esto, all of this forest down to put coffee. Y, 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 eh, no están, <sighs> And now the, the mountain itself, the site, is losing its power because that's the power it has, its spiritual significance, its spiritual and energetic power that it puts out into the world. You can see up there, there's even a communications tower on top of it now. And, and they're even taking more trees down there, putting more coffee, putting more chemicals at the top of it. This mountain is one of the most sacred sites to the Arwako and one they see as vitally important for the whole of the earth. As we walked up the mountain, we saw that devastating amounts of the forest here had been cleared. And at the very top of the mountain, which the Arwako view as the most sacred part, there was a large clearing with an illegal cell phone tower and the surrounding ground planted with coffee. At all times, men in our Wako culture 
carry a specific type of gourd with them called a poporo. The poporo is a highly symbolic and sacred object and its meaning and use is intricate and complex. In one sense, it symbolizes masculinity and the responsibility of our Wako men, as well as the spiritual journey and the acquisition of knowledge. When the Arawako scrape the poporo with a stick, they are often setting spiritual intentions and making prayers for peace in the world, something that one can observe them doing countless times throughout a given day. So this is the communication tower. The claro or the... Sabemos? No, no, no. To connect Pueblo Bayo to here. Uh-huh. And have you taken permission with you? No. Nothing. We already have a denuncia. We have a document. They have a document that they made that's denouncing this. So we can put that on the chain. Perfecto. In the, in the denouncement, of this, it says the importance of this area from the perspective of the Mamos, and he thinks that tomorrow they're going to bring the document to us so that mm. we can we can see that. Oh, okay. Y uh, tal vez ese campesino está ganando dinero para esto también. Sí. Entonces este es el que nosotros queríamos eh, recuperar para 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 cuidar esto. Para no, no, para hacer un monte que esto se vuelva una montaña, así como estuvimos allá, uh -huh. se vuelve una montaña, esto que se crece, uh -huh. esto es So that they want to, they want to reclaim this area because it's extremely important and they can't let it turn into the mountain that we just passed through, which is the same mountain, just a different section. So this is their highest level of priority is to get this back, to let it, start growing back to how it needs to be. This is pretty much the top of the mountain. Como Biscungui es el dueño de la comida extranjera, de todos los comidas que hay, y ya siendo afectado, no solamente afecta a la comida que está aquí, sino a todo el nivel de vida. Y ya como los Tribagina, los que se enferman eh, de cáncer de paralítico, es principalmente es por la comida. Uh -huh. So he says that not only is this affecting the area here with the springs and the poisoning and the, the devitalization, but the mountain itself is energetically and spiritually connected as the the dueño, the holder, the, the, the one in charge of all of the foods for everyone inside the world outside of this energetic black line. So we're standing on top of like the, the principal god and goddess in charge of our food system. And he says that this is a direct relation to why our foods have so many chemicals, why they're lacking so many nutrients, why, it, why it's not done the right way with, with through consciousness. And that happens on a magnified level to everywhere outside in our little brother land. And in that sense, he's saying that's the reason that we have a lot of different cancers and, and sicknesses because all of those sicknesses are coming from our food system. And this mountain is directly related to our food system. And as we're walking through it in the real physical world, it's you've got a communication tower on it. It's been pretty deforested. It's getting poisoned every, every year. This is only the, the second year that it's been like this. And this is the first year that the top has been taken over. And it's all for coffee. All of it's happening because of coffee. So uh, some form of, of conscious consumption, some education, some form of combating volunteerism, regenerative people who want to get involved in this. We need people to come listen to these stories, understand them, and put their effort towards you know, reharmonizing, not for the space here necessarily, but for the entire planet. And they're inviting us as little brother to say, hey, you know, we've been taking care of this space and this is what it is. And we know this for a fact. You can talk to all of our different tribes and all of our different elders and all of our different people. And they're going to tell you exactly this. So we invite you, please come, please help. 
This is a global epidemic experience. Really. This is an endemic experience. This is not good. Wow. Okay, this is extremely, extremely important. Here, what they're looking at, it goes down a little bit, where now a barbed wire fence has been put through. This used to be a little pond, and it's, a, and it's one of the most sacred spaces here within the mountains, and it what, it's connected directly to Nabosimake. And here, they used to they come to consult to get notifications, basically, from the entire planet. This is the, like a, uh, a viewing portal to the outside world. And there's many very special things that that means that you can extract from that. What happened was the paramilitary groups who come around and do drug running and are also paid by the biggest landowners around here to push people out so that they can keep buying up land. They came and they dug out this channel right here that we're standing on. It goes right up behind Goodwill and Ryan. And that they used to, to bring the water out to bathe in and do whatever they wanted to do. So it started to dry the the, the pond and then there was a very special rock that energetically kept the humidity there and the people came in and they moved the rock so now that that energy portal has been broken it's been dried now it's completely dry they used to have um, different uh, their own bananas like a specific type of banana that's just to these mountains and now they um, it dried off and, and those died as well. But the Mamos say that the, what they call a document, which is like the, the energetic use and, and the existence on a spiritual plane outside of the material world, there is something that makes this exist. And the existence of that document on a blockchain, for instance, is still there and it's still sitting there. But the thing that now is gone since the rock was moved and it's dry and everything has been taken away, is the seal. So there's, they said with our help and with the help of everyone else in the world, it's possible to reseal it so that that document can come back into the material world and re-be what it needs to be. But if we don't do that, there is chance that the entire document and the entire consciousness and knowledge of it will be gone. Um, y el nombre? El árbol? Coguina. Coguina. Coguina is the name of the tree and it has an incredible importance in their culture. They, they use it to dye for sacred energetic works in their cotton. They use it as uh, dye in their bags. They also use it for other practices and, and techniques throughout their entire culture. It's a very sacred and interconnected um, tree for them. It used to exist in other areas. It only um, it used to exist on a different mountain where now their communication towers of the different cell phone companies have put illegal communication towers on top and they say that energetically that's the reason that the trees have died there and that they no longer are present. The those trees on that, the ones that used to live there and now the ones that live here, they communicate back on an energetic system back to uh, Nabusimake, just like the towers. And the ones in Nabusimake are now dying because their other pole, the energetic link down here, is, being, is, is dying. In this land, it's right next to a place that has been clear cut and it's affecting the, the energetic systems here and the, the root systems. And so these ones are getting sick and drying out. And this land here is owned by a farmer. And they're very preoccupied or very worried by the fact that these could get clear cut because just 20 yards away, it is completely clear cut. So the land they've been organizing and negotiating with a farmer and 
they've been able to make a personal deal two years ago. So the time is running out. The, the man is old. He wants to move to the city. And he's threatening to, to sell to another farmer. And the other farmer is interested in, in planting coffee. The amount of money that's needed is roughly $80,000 in order to buy the land and conserve it under their people. And the other land that has been already deforested turned into a newly planted coffee farm and has a communication tower on it is $16,000. So combined with the two of those on the top of this mountain, uh, we can have conservation, regeneration, reforestation for a total of $96,000. The, the $16,000 land also is the forest that we need to regenerate in order to bring back the very enormously sacred lake that is in charge of Little Brother's food system. So starting with the $16,000 land to reforest, manage and work with their mamos and their energy healers to come in and figure out how to bring this lake back so that the planetary food system can start to heal itself. Then moving from there, putting $80,000 into this conservation project, we'll have a very strong ba base to start taking back the whole mountain. And these are the last two of these trees? This is the last area where these trees exist. Mm -hmm. If this farm gets bought by someone other than us and gets taken and turned into a coffee farm, then they will. we will lose the DNA of this tree. The spirit of this tree will no longer be on the planet. Diam and Kelsey Faith of Sun Nation are devoted to their mission of helping the Arwako people. As they see the rapid destruction of their indigenous land, and understand the significance of this territory. The most essential project that the Arwako have asked for their help with is the protection of Biskungwi. They intend to slowly buy back the rights to the mountain so they can preserve what remains and regenerate what has been lost. And they're starting with focusing their efforts on reclaiming the top of the mountain and working their way down they are currently asking for support in this mission from those that feel resonant with the cause and are willing to offer support. I've put a link in the description below this video where you can donate to Protecting Biskungwi if you want to support, and where you can contact Sun Nation if you want to get further involved. After our journey to Biskungwi, we went back down to the jungle where we packed up our camp and returned to our original campsite on Gunkeroen. The next morning, we were taken to another nearby sacred site, a deep cave in the jungle that is said to be connected to Biskungwi. We were taken there by the Mamos simply to feel and receive the energy of this sacred place. While there, we performed another ceremony and were asked to pray and call for those that are able and willing to help them protect these sacred mountains. My heart felt immensely for these people and their concern for the protection of their home and for the entire world that they see as being deeply connected to this home. After returning to our camp, we were at last welcomed to visit the Arwako village down the hill from us. The last few days of our time here felt like a true cultural exchange where we got to explore their village and they felt more comfortable visiting us at our camp. Each day the children played around our camp, and each night the men, women, and children sat with us around our fire. It was truly a special experience. On the last night, we had a ceremony discussing how we could work together to be defenders of nature and to help them in protecting the heart of the world. When speaking of the damage that is occurring to this land, Boon Kwanimaku shared that there are certain minerals in the mountain springs that nourish the coral reefs in the Caribbean Sea. Because of the deforestation and the way the land is being used, these springs and streams are being affected and aren't able to reach the big rivers that feed into the ocean. As a result, he says that the coral reefs are being affected 
and this is devastating for the whole planet. The entire worldview of the Arwako is centered around being defenders of nature and protectors of the heart of the world. They have a deep awareness of the interconnectedness of ecosystems and believe that this land holds a vital importance for the well-being of the entire planet, as every ecosystem on the planet can be found here. There are glaciers and snow-capped peaks, alpine forests, dense jungles, deserts, grasslands, tropical beaches, and ocean. According to the Arwako, the health of this land is directly connected to the health of the entire planet. Could this mountain range really be the heart of the world as they say it is? Or is this just an ethnocentric worldview of a tribe that has always existed in this place? For those of us that have never heard of the heart of the world, it's easy to discount it as the latter. But for the Mamos and the people of the Arwako, they are adamant in their belief that this land is indeed the heart of the entire planet, and they have been tasked as the protectors of this land, which they have been doing for as long as they have existed, and doing so peacefully and non-violently. Whether this is truly the heart of the world or not, it is clearly an important and uniquely positioned ecosystem that affects many surrounding environments, and it is being severely threatened and deforested at an alarming rate. The Arawako people have little to no money. In their traditional culture, money is non-existent. They also have no written language or books, as they believe in listening and reading the book of nature, where all of their wisdom is gained. In my personal travels around the world, I have yet to see a culture that is so embodied in their philosophy, truly living as a part of their environment, carrying themselves with dignity, humility, and wisdom. They seem to have a depth of understanding about the way that nature's systems work, an understanding that is embedded in their culture's worldview, and one that is considerably lacking in ours. Because of this stark contrast in their understanding of nature from our own society's understanding, I believe them when they say that this land is a vitally important ecosystem, and I feel inspired to support them in their mission of protecting it, and in protecting all of the Earth's precious ecosystems. Our modern culture has a huge misunderstanding that indigenous cultures and the way that indigenous people live is somehow primitive outdated, and no longer relevant or valuable to us. The truth is, we have a lot to learn from these people. They existed harmoniously with their environment for thousands of years, and they understand their place in the web of life. Our modern culture, in as little as a few hundred years, has caused the extinction of many species, and has threatened the entirety of life on Earth. And somehow, people have the arrogance to think we're more intelligent and advanced. The destruction of ecosystems and the loss of sacred land that is occurring here in the Sierra Nevada is happening all around the world. In large part, it is caused by the culture of consumption that we have created. Most people no longer have a good relationship with where their resources come from, nor do they produce their own resources like growing their own food or crafting things from their environment. We just consume and consume and consume and also generate alarming amounts of waste. Waste that doesn't just go away because it's left our homes in a garbage bin, but that accumulates and pollutes the land. Yet, because it is out of our sight, we put it out of mind. Now, after so many years of this behavior, it is becoming harder and harder for these things to be out of sight and out of mind, and there is a real necessity for us to recognize how we are living and to take responsibility for ourselves and our lives. And this seems to be the key point, that each one of us must take this responsibility for ourselves and how we live. We can't rely on governments or corporations to make the change. For as long as they are making profit, and as long as we keep supporting them, they have no incentive to change. We need to change and be the change we want to see in the world. We can be selective about the companies we support. We can be intentional about the way we utilize our resources. We can find natural solutions to the modern problems that we face. 
and we can learn a lot if we humble ourselves and open ourselves to the wisdom of the indigenous people that we have been oppressing for hundreds of years. If there is one thing that I have truly gained from this experience with the Arwako people, it is the teaching that they have given simply by how they live, a teaching that has sparked the remembrance that I am more than just my social identity, but that I am a human being of the earth, that my roots are deep and ancient, and that I desire to defend the natural world that is my true home. I don't know exactly how to do this yet, but I see that a big part of it is unlearning the ways of the artificial world and returning to the ways of the natural world. And I am thankful that we have the Arwako as elder brothers here to guide us. I also see that while the change must occur within myself, I also can't do this alone. So I invite you and all of us that care to defend nature to heal and transform our minds and to come together with this shared intention to take care of our home. More important than our race, our nationality, our religion, or our political stance is the fact that we are human beings of the earth and our earth is in danger. It is my deepest wish that we can come together to protect our planet for ourselves and for future generations. And after my experience here, I now know with certainty that this wish is shared by the Arwako, the four indigenous people of Colombia, and with indigenous people around the world. On our final day here, we had breakfast, packed up our tents, and drove down the mountain to Pueblo Bello, where we stayed in the hostel for a few nights, and our group gradually parted ways to continue on our individual journeys, each with a shared memory of this once-in-a-lifetime experience and a burning inspiration in our hearts to continue this mission of defending nature in our own unique ways. Well, after two weeks of being in the mountains, staying with the Arwako, I am back in civilization. Um, here in Pueblo Bello, which is a small town still within the Black Line, the recognized territory of the four indigenous peoples. Um, unfortunately, this is an illegal town that's been put here, which is disregarding the land that is rightfully owned by the Arwako. Um, but nevertheless, I'm here, I'm back in civilization and I'm feeling it, I'm feeling the, the difference. Uh, feeling the stimulation and the chaos of the city and as I'm here one of the things I'm really noticing is that as I re re-enter back into the world having that two weeks to just be in nature and to learn from examples of people that are living very close to nature was really restorative really refreshing to to just have that time to, to unplug and reconnect and moving forward I want to just be really intentional about everything that I do it's one of the big messages that's coming through for me is everything that I do everything I say everything I agree to everything that I eat things that I wear things that I purchase decisions that I make moment to moment I really want to feel into how my heart feels how my gut feels and make that decision from from a place that's authentic and integrity to me and to to just be more intentional with the way that I move in the world so that's one of the big lessons that's coming through especially as I'm here surrounded by all the, the stimulus of the city um, and there's so many so many more lessons that I'm have learned and will continue to learn as I integrate I'm sure uh, a big one also being just to make that time to continue to connect with nature to go outside to be in nature to remember that nature is the real world <laughs> nature is the the real the real world the the reality that we all come from this artificial world that we live in is something that we have created and imposed on nature and something that 
really disconnects us from our true nature. So I think just spending more time outside helps me stay in touch with that reality of the natural world. So that's, that's all I have presently <laughs> in this moment, but um, I'm really thankful for the experience. I'm thankful for the Arwako. I'm thankful for the community of people that I was with. I'm thankful to Sun Nation for organizing the event that allowed us to, to have that experience. And as I reintegrate uh, back into the world, the artificial world, and I go back to my life in the States, um, I'm carrying with me this desire to have a deeper connection to nature and to move more intentionally through the world, through my actions in my day-to-day -to -day -to -day life. I left Pueblo Bello with a few people from the group, and we returned to Valle du Par. We shared one last meal together, then I left for the airport, beginning my journey home to the States. As I left Colombia and returned to the US, I felt deep gratitude for this experience. It amazes me how once the experience has passed, it is just a memory, like some two-week dream that I was living in. I know that what matters now is how I choose to live moving forward and how I apply the lessons that I gained from this experience. I also know that this is an ongoing process, a part of the journey of life. And as I continue my life's journey, I know that I will hold within me a feeling of deep joy and appreciation for this unique experience and this profound journey to the heart of the world.